Hello everyone and welcome to a new edition of the Jazz Flashes videocast, a videocast that will be published in my jazz blog Jazz Flashes, which you can read at jazzflashes.blogspot.com. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez and I am talking to you from the small town of Martin, Tennessee. In today's videocast we're going to be talking about a man whose music I have always enjoyed, a man who was forward-looking and innovative, a man who knew what he wanted to do, who knew the sound he wanted to get, who knew the goal he wanted to achieve, but unfortunately because of this, because he was so innovative and so modern in the 1940s and 1950s, he never achieved the recognition that I believe he deserved. I'm talking about the one and only Herbie Nichols, the pianist and composer from New York City who was born in 1919 and passed away in 1963. I've been reading about him quite a bit and I've been listening to the few recordings that he made in his lifetime and I would like to start the video cast by recommending this really interesting book written by A.B. Spellman and published originally in the mid 1960s. It's called Four Lives in the Bebop Business and these four lives are of course that of the great Herbie Nichols, but also Cecil Taylor has a chapter. Another chapter is uh, about Jackie McLean, and another chapter is about Ornette Coleman. Four fantastic musicians uh, that it is really well, well worth reading about. The book is called Four Lives in the Bebop Business, written by A.B. Spellman. Herbie Nichols, what a great musician, uh, what a fantastic composer, a great performer. Born in New York City in 1919, he was not understood during his lifetime, but he has become a cult figure since his passing in 1963. His style was very innovative, very different within the bebop of the 1940s and 1950s, very much ahead of his time. Unfortunately, he spent a lot of time playing Dixieland music, which was not the bebop that he enjoyed playing. He did not dislike Dixieland necessarily, but um, playing traditional jazz is not exactly what he wanted to be doing at the end of the 40s and throughout the 1950s, but he had to do it because he had to find a way to make ends meet. His family uh, settled in Harlem and uh, he started uh, studying piano from the age of seven or eight, more or less, and he was interesting, interested bo both in jazz and in classical music. Uh, composers, classical composers like Satie and Bartok and Stravinsky were always interesting to Herbie Nichols, and even though maybe he was not uh, really influenced by them uh, musically, uh, at least he was influenced by them in his interest uh, in blazing new trails in the 1940s and 1950s. He was also a very talented composer. He wrote some fine music, jazz tunes and calypso tunes and mambo tunes and different styles because he uh, was hoping that at some point he would strike gold with uh, maybe not with jazz or maybe not with calypso, maybe not with mambo, but at some point he was hoping that he would write a song that would uh, give him some financial security. That never really happened, but um, he made some great music along the way, and he also was uh, the man who wrote a song that we all remember, because Billie Holiday recorded that song, Lady Sings the Blues. Uh, it's a song that was written by the great Herbie Nichols. He spent a lot of time playing with musicians who were way beneath his league. He was not as talented as he was, but he also had the chance to record with some fantastic um, people. Uh, not a lot, but he did record some, um, just a few sessions with some great musicians, and he also performed live with other great musicians, renowned musicians like Sonny Stitt and Lucky Thompson and Illinois Jaquette and J.J. Johnson, the trombonist. Unfortunately, uh, there are no recordings of uh, most of um, those collaborations with these musicians. Uh, and so we'll never know exactly what those collaborations uh, would have sounded like. He was never at all as popular as uh, 
some of his contemporaries like Charlie Parker or Dizzy Gillespie or Thelonious Monk. Uh, in fact, it's quite interesting that it was Harvey Nichols who first wrote an article praising the music of Thelonious Monk. Several critics believe that uh, his uh, style is a cross between the music of Thelonious Monk and that of Teddy Wilson, but in any case he always kept a very personal uh, style. Mary Lou Williams, the pianist, was one of the few who during his lifetime um, uh, appreciated the music of Herbie Nichols and she got around to recording some of the compositions by Herbie Nichols like At The Function or Mary's Waltz which was, was originally titled the Bebop Waltz but Mary Lou Williams retitled it Mary's Waltz and that was one of the uh, recordings that Mary Lou Williams made of music by Nichols. Nichols was introduced to Mary Lou Williams apparently by Thelonious Monk himself. Harvey did record, uh, not a lot, but he did record uh, in the year of 1956. Uh, between May and August of 1956, he made five sessions. He led five sessions for Blue Note Records. Alfred Lyon finally agreed to record Nichols, who was pestering him for a chance. And uh, those uh, five sessions include some of the best music that Herbie Nichols ever recorded. Uh, all of them are, are original compositions by Nichols and he appears always in a trio context uh, with uh, Teddy Kodak and Al McKibben on bass and Art Blakey or Max Roach on drums. Really good company right there and uh, this really is uh, the first uh, collection of recordings that uh, people should listen to when it comes to uh, discovering the music of Herbie Nichols. Uh, the recordings, uh, 30 songs in total plus 18 alternate takes that survive, uh, never made a big impact on the uh, buying public, uh, although they were praised by some um, critics at the time. Uh, insiders knew the, recording, the recordings. Insiders liked the recordings, but uh, the public at large uh, didn't pay particularly much attention. But uh, thinking um, about Herbie Nichols from the point of view of today, this is where we should start listening to his music. About a year later, in November of 1957, he uh, visited the studios again, not for Blue Note this time, but for Bethlehem, and uh, he recorded an album entitled Love, Gloom, Cash, Love. Uh, again in a trio setting with uh, George Duvivier on bass and Danny Richmond on drums. Uh, Danny Richmond was the drummer who was working with Charlie Mingus at the time. Uh, it's probably not as powerful, uh, probably not as daring as the uh, recordings he made for Blue Note in 1956, but it's still a lovely album with um, very innovative compositions. Uh, uh, most of the reco uh, songs recorded here uh, are originals by uh, Herbie Nichols, uh, although there are also uh, two standards, actually one standard, uh, Too Close for Comfort, that receives the uh, Herbie Nichols treatment, and then a song that was fairly new at the time, All the Way, which Frank Sinatra made uh, into a hit from his movie The Joker is Wild, uh, and that's a uh, song that you don't get to hear very often in a bebop context, but Duvivier and Richmond and Nichols uh, do a fine job with that song as well as with the many originals that Nichols contributed to this session. Love, Gloom, Cash, Love, uh, recorded in 1957 for Bethlehem Records. And that was the last time, believe it or not, that Herbie Nichols uh, led his own uh, session. That was the last session he uh, led because in the last few years of his life he didn't record as far as I know but he did appear on the East Coast quite frequently sometimes in better clubs than others. Uh, he also made a tour of Scandinavia in 1962 but again playing not um, 
uh, bebop music, but Dixieland music. He uh, had some fond memories of that trip to Scandinavia, even though he didn't really make a lot of money. And as far as I know, there are no recordings of the uh, gigs in Scandinavia uh, from 1962. Um, he did uh, also study music thoroughly, uh, particularly African music. He was um, enthralled by uh, African music, which he believed uh, lay at the very root of jazz, and he was interested uh, particularly in African percussion, which probably explains why his style is so percussive, uh, also explains why there is this connection with Thelonious Monk, uh, whose music was also dissonant and also quite percussive with unexpected rhythms, the way Herbie Nicholas's music was. Uh, he kept studying music and kept uh, this fascination for African music uh, to the very end uh, of his life. Uh, in the early 1960s, with uh, hard bop and the new thing, and this new jazz music that uh, was being produced, it looked like this would be a good moment for Herbie Nichols, but unfortunately he couldn't take advantage of the fact that he probably could have uh, made some interesting contributions to hard bop and to the new thing. Um, he couldn't do it because he was diagnosed with leukemia and unfortunately the disease ended his career and ended his life in April of 1963. He passed away uh, also in New York City and uh, according to Spellman in this book Four Lives in the Bebop Business um, the last few years and months of uh, Nichols's career, uh, Nichols's life, were um, not very happy ones. He felt like he was misunderstood by everyone, uh, that he really didn't uh, stand a chance, nobody would give him a chance, and um, he was uh, living from paycheck to paycheck pretty much and trying to find jobs, uh, trying to find work uh, musical work that is wherever he could um, find it. Um, unfortunately uh, he didn't um, get a chance to make more contributions. Uh, he would have probably had a lot to say in the 1960s but what we have by him is absolutely recommendable and uh, there are two albums that um, I recommend everyone out there to um, look for. Uh, one of them is the three CD set on Blue Note that includes the complete recordings that he made for Blue Note in 1956. Absolutely a jewel, absolutely recommendable for anyone uh, who really likes uh, classic um, bebop and um, the kind of uh, music that Herbie Nichols uh, recorded uh, is very well exemplified in the recordings of 1956 but also Love, Gloom, Cash, Love which he recorded for Bethlehem Records in 1957 that's another album that I would buy after listening to the uh, Blue Note recordings which fortunately are still available even though they were originally reissued on CD back in 1997 and this brings us to the end of this second video cast. Uh, I'm really um, happy to be here uh, talking about uh, good jazz music, talking about the great Herbie Nichols. Remember, Four Lives in the Bebop Business, a book by A.B. Spellman, where you can find some good information about the one and only Herbie Nichols. Time now to say goodbye. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us. And uh, until I see you again, keep listening to jazz music. Have a good time. So long, everybody. This is Anton Garcia Fernandez signing off from Martin, Tennessee.